All right. Uh, just would ask everyone to stay on mute um, until we start the uh, question and answer uh, period of today's uh, first student scholars presentation. Um, I'm A.G. Harmon uh, here at the Columbus School of Law, Catholic University of America. And on behalf of the faculty, let me thank you from zooming, for zooming in uh, to this first of our uh, presentation this year. Um, the series was instituted uh, 14 years ago in order to recognize notable legal scholarship produced by members of the student body. Uh, during the previous academic year and to foster the skills associated with presenting and defending that scholarship in a professional conference style setting. Today's presentation will be made by third year student Liam Fulling. Before I introduce Liam, a few words about the respondent to his presentation, uh, Emeritus Professor Clifford Fishman. Uh, Professor Fishman, a graduate of Columbia University Law School began his professional career by serving for eight years as an assistant district attorney in the New York County District Attorney's Office and as chief investigating assistant district attorney in New York City's Special Narcotics Prosecutor's Office. He joined our faculty in 1977, where he uh, taught criminal law, criminal procedure, and evidence. With his co-author and CUA law alum, Ann McKenna, uh, Professor Fishman is the author of the multi-volume works Wiretapping and Eavesdropping and Jones on Evidence. He's also the author of A Student's Guide to Hearsay, as well as articles and journals too, too numerous to mention. Um, an eminent authority in his field, he has testified before Congress, governmental departments and agencies and various bar associations on many occasions. I would add that uh, he has only recently retired from teaching full time but retirement is, is not a term his meaning really stretches far enough to fit a man of, of such continuous industry. So we, uh, I, I don't really think that's an appropriate term. We'll have to come up with a new one. Uh, now, William Fulling. He graduated from the University of Maryland College Park with a bachelor's degree in broadcast journalism and government and politics. He has interned for U.S. Senators Tom Tillis and Richard Burr and Governor Larry Hogan's re-election campaign, as well as for Fox News and NBC News Meet the Press. Uh, he is interned also at the American Action Forum as a technology and innovation policy intern, and last summer was a summer associate at Keller and Heckman, working in their telecommunications practice group. He continues to work at that firm part-time and looks forward to joining it as a junior associate after graduation. So congratulations to him on that. Practicing in the regulatory fields of telecommunications and data privacy law. Liam's interest in the topic upon which he will speak arose when Mark Zuckerberg transitioned his company Facebook to meta platforms as it uh, represented a shift from a highly lucrative and comparably safe industry to one that is riddled with uncertainties. In the face of financial blowback and pervasive skepticism, Zuckerberg has seemingly doubled down on his belief that this shift represents the future because a large part of Meta Platform's goal is to garner the widespread adoption of smart glasses, notably through the use of AR and VR technology, he began to investigate how many other companies were in investing in similar projects. So I will turn the floor over to Liam, who will present his work entitled, I am the next revolution of wearable technology, how the law should frame smart glasses. Liam. Thank you, Professor. Share my screen here. Can you see that? All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Harmon, for the introduction, and thank you to everyone taking the time to listen to my presentation today. I'm hoping after 20 or so minutes, at the very least, you'll come away having learned something new. But what I'm really hoping is that you will have pre-ordered a pair of smart glasses so as to boost the credibility of my thesis, um, but we'll see how convincing I can be. I'd also like to thank Professor Fishman, uh, who will be conducting today's response and who served as my expert reader last year while I was conducting this research and writing my journal comment. Um, my writing style ranges from merely long-winded to seriously bombastic, so Professor Fishman was instrumental in helping me to narrow my scope, although it's still broad, and come to sound legal conclusions worthy of a presentation such as this. Um, I'd like to begin by actually reading the introductory paragraphs of my journal article 
because I think they do the best job of setting the scene and establishing my art argument. Um, as the title of this presentation reflects, my comment was titled, Eyeing the Next Revolution of Wearable Technology, How the Law Should Frame Smart Glasses. Um, and if you're wondering if the most impressive aspect of my scholarship was that I was able to fit not one, but two puns into the title, uh, you would be correct. And it's mostly gonna be downhill from here, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, so it begins. Smart glasses, like any other innovative and dimension shattering technology, must survive the growing pains of market entry. Sure, it's hard enough to develop a product that augments important audiovisual information directly into our reality, but have developers even thought about the consumer? I mean, are these glasses practical, easy to use? Do they even work with this outfit? Despite everything from the downright flops, I'm looking at you, Google Glass, to the simply underwhelming, have you even heard of Snapchat spectacles? Companies continue to pour money into smart glasses technology. While it's easy to be nearsighted about uh, about the capabilities of glasses as we now know them. At least 25,000 smart glasses technology patents from more than 100 companies strongly lend themselves to only one conclusion. The next revolution of wearable technology is nearly here. Now I'll pause here to note that what I wanted to say was that the next revolution of wearable technology is already here. Professor Fishman encouraged me to say that the next revolution is nearly here, which I think saves me about 20 or so years by technology adoption standards to have this prediction come true and not look like an absolute fool. Um, so that just goes to show the importance of an expert reader. Um, so it continues on. One can imagine the many benefits smart glasses may offer, but experts have already begun to conceive the potential liabilities associated with them. For example, augmented reality in smart glasses may create safety issues when used improperly, such as when they become a distraction for the driver of a motor vehicle. Smart glasses may also have health impacts, which could result in liability for manufacturers. Further, wearing smart glasses in public raises a seemingly indeterminable number of privacy and surveillance questions, which the law must directly respond to or current jurisprudence must envelop. Plus, the concern over real-time data collection through smart glasses technology is in step with the ongoing debates in Congress and state legislatures, a problem which will only continue to get worse as the tech develops. The law should recognize that these smart glasses could soon be in vogue, whether in a technical or commercial setting, and prepare itself to respond, formulating standards and regulations for their use without hindering companies' incentive to continue innovating will make it more likely that these devices move our society forward without sac sacrificing our safety, rights, and liberties. So this presentation will discuss the current laws regulating three major concerns that I found were associated with smart glasses. And that's uh, public safety, public surveillance, and data collection and privacy. It will then discuss these issues in detail and propose suggestions for improving current frameworks to adapt to smart glasses increased use, as well as indicate areas where significant legal developments need to be focused. Uh, specifically, it will argue that a light touch approach to smart glasses technology is necessary when responding to user safety and public surveillance concerns, but that a more forceful response to data privacy is a legislative priority. So just taking a step back, you might be wondering exactly what I mean when I use the term smart glasses. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with virtual reality goggles, which are products that allow users to be transplanted into an entirely digital world, whether for work, play, or consumerism. Um, this sort of device was first made popular in a gaming capacity by companies such as Oculus, but is now also the focus of Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse, which includes gaming and non-gaming components. There are also augmented reality glasses that create digital displays that are overlaid into the real world view of the wearer and mixed reality glasses that create digital displays that can interact with the real world. And while I would consider all of these goggles and glasses as subsets of smart glasses technology, my thesis hinges more on the adoption of smart glasses that have the capability to perform the function of a smartphone and other forms of wearable technology. Such product, products will allow users to make calls or answer messages, take photos and videos from their point of view, listen to music, interact with apps, use GPS navigation and display an AR overlay and most other functions of a connected smartphone. So the first attempt at this type of product you might remember was Google's introduction of Google Glass in 2013. Um, at first, there was a lot of excitement about the product. Um, that excitement quickly turned into ridicule because the product was extremely expensive and looked terrible. And people that wore them were colloquially called glass holes. But there was also concern that 
Google Glass had the capability to take photos inconspicuously, and one bar in Seattle notably banned them before they were even released, and other businesses followed suit. So the market entry for this type of product was rocky at best, and Glass has now actually shifted its entire consumer demographic to companies that will use Glass for the purpose of technical training and increasing uh, efficiency in certain daily tasks. But despite there not being a product as highly anticipated as Google Glass in the years since, it is evident that big name players, so, as well as startups, are investing in technology and betting on its adoption once they get the market entry formula right. So as you can see here, Amazon, Microsoft, Meta, and Apple have all developed or are developing some form of smart glasses technology, and close to 150 other companies globally are doing the same. Some estimates project augmented reality investment to reach 46 billion by 2025 and 92.5 billion by 2027. And global shipments of smart glasses are expected to top 5.2 million by 2024. This was enough to convince me that we were heading towards a revolution in wearable technology. And with the trend as clear as this, it seemed important to identify the legal, in, uh, legal issues involved with the potential mass adoption of smart glasses and see what an appropriate legislative response would look like. Through my research, and as previously mentioned, the three main concerns associated with smart glasses involved public safety, public surveillance, and data privacy. Beginning with public safety, the main concerns are that the smart glasses will become a distraction while users are walking, biking, or driving, and that the EMF radiation being emitted by Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connected smart glasses will be harmful to a user's health. So here's a look at the current laws that are associated and address some of these concerns. First, there are common law torts that address harm caused by somebody acting either intentionally or unintentionally. These are assault, battery, and negligence. Next, there are distracted driving laws, which limit the use of smartphones and other connected devices while driving. Um, after the introduction of Google Glass, some states considered implementing laws that would ban smart glasses while driving if they became more popular. Um, and then there are also EMF radiation standards set by the FCC, which are currently set at 1.6 watts per kilogram average over one gram of tissue um, that can be ab ab absorbed by the human body, and that's called the specific absorption rate. So the public safety legal issues that regulators will face are whether smart, uh, whether smart glasses should be banned generally in public settings, um, whether they should be banned while driving, and whether the FCC should study and set new EMF radiation standards for smart glasses. So through my research, I found that current common law torts and public safety laws are broad enough to encompass the most likely safety concerns associated with smart glasses, which mostly include them becoming a distraction while in use, resulting in some form of assault, battery, or negligent harm on another person. However, I argued that it is not in the state's best interest to place an outright ban on the use of smart glasses while driving. Practically speaking, smart glasses are being designed to be virtually indiscernible from regular glasses to benefit consumers. So it would be virtually impossible to enforce the law proactively um, because no law enforcement official could tell that a driver was wearing or using smart glasses um, until after the fact, after they pulled them over, after an accident has occurred. Um, and after the introduction of Google Glass, a California case involving this issue was actually thrown out uh, because there was a lack of evidence to show that the smart glasses were on while the driver was operating the vehicle. But more importantly, research has shown that smart glasses are actually less of a distraction to a driver than smartphones, quite obviously because a user can utilize the functionality of smart glasses while keeping their eyes on the road. Smart glasses will likely be equipped with the capability to overlay AR driving directions into the real world view of the wearer to make driving safer and easier. And it will also broadcast auditory driving directions. Moreover, smart glasses technology is being developed to track, track driver drowsiness and alert drivers that may be drifting dangerously close to falling asleep at the wheel, which will hugely benefit those tasked with driving long, distance, long distances frequently like truck drivers. So it's my suggestion that smart glasses not be banned while driving, but that penalties can be imposed on drivers that are found to have been utilizing non-driving related smart glasses functionalities when a driving infraction has occurred. There's also been concern expressed about the amount of EMF radiation that is absorbed by a smart glasses user and whether this will have any health impacts in the long term. Studies have shown that long-term high levels of exposure to EMF radiation can cause immune system issues, premature cell death, neurological issues, and cardiovascular diseases. 
So the FCC currently regulates EMF exposure for smartphones, but this standard may not be applicable to a device that is consistently worn on the head. Because Bluetooth and Wi-Fi connected devices typically emit high amounts of EMF, smart glasses equipped with these functionalities need to be studied to determine the effects of EMF radiation close to the brain. Also, the FCC needs to reconsider the models it uses to determine the specific absorption rate because it is typically associated with an adult body size. Because smart glasses are likely to be popular with a younger generation, we may need to recalibrate the specific absorption rate uh, to take account of that factor. And finally, the FCC standards do not take into account the effect of long-term non-ionizing radiation um, worn on the head, which is how smart glasses will be worn and probably for long periods of time. So before smart glasses hit the market in mass, the FCC should consider studying the specific absorption rate of EMF emitting smart glasses worn near the head and eye for long periods of time. Excuse me. The eye is um, a particularly vulnerable part of the body to EMF radiation because of the relative lack of blood flow to dissipate the heat that is caused by EMF radiation. And plus the glasses portion of the device may also serve to trap in more EMF radiation around the eye, which could increase the effects of EMF radiation on uh, bodily tissue. So moving to public surveillance, the main concerns are the use of smart glasses functionalities to take non-consensual photos and videos to record conversations without the consent of other people and for the government to utilize facial recognition technology. So one of the most important aspects of the law as it relates to public surveillance is the reasonable expectation test from Katz versus United States. The test from that case relates to the Fourth Amendment and states first that a person have exhibited an actual subjective expectation of privacy and second that the expectation be one that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable. This test has also been applied to situations in which private citizens are said to have invaded the privacy of other private citizens and it basically stands for the proposition that things that are done in public are generally fair game for others to observe. Um, one year after CATS was decided, Congress passed Title II of the Organized Crime Control and Safe Streets Act, which protects wire and oral communications from governmental and private surveillance. This law provides that oral communication that is uttered by a person exhibiting an expectation that such communication is not subject to interception is protected. Um, so again, this essentially functions to show that conversations in public are fair game. For conversations that a person is actively participating in, state law regarding one party and two party consent will govern whether conversation can be recorded. In one party consent states, only one party needs to consent so the side of, so the side of a conversation that wants to record the conversation can do so. Additionally, under situations under color of law, meaning under the authorization of government officials, the consent of one participant in a conversation is enough to legalize the recording of a conversation. Uh, moreover, there's too many to, to list here, but um, state peeping Tom laws and the intrusion upon seclusion tort can help to alleviate unwanted photography and videography of private situations. The Video Voyeurism Prote Prevention Act prevents non-consensual photography and videography of a sexual nature. <coughs> And finally, state and local restrictions on the use of facial rec recognition technology by state actors prevent the use of facial recognition technology for the general purpose of policing. Such restrictions have been implemented in California, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Vermont, and Virginia. Um, Illinois, Texas, and Washington have regulations restricting biometric data collection as well, which can include facial recognition. So um, the concerns associated with smart glasses that can record audio and take pictures and video have been abundant since the introduction of Google Glass. Um, people are worried that secretly recorded video could be used to blackmail people, stalk unknowing victims, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, um, capture images of the people in compromising or private situations, plan crimes or terror attacks and create a police state through the use of Orwellian facial recognition police practices. Um, moreover, because smart glasses are being designed to look ordinary, they can be harder to detect as having the, the capabilities that I've discussed. They 
can be easily manipulated, such as placing tape over light indicators that are meant to show that picture, audio, or video recording is being taken. And they can be hacked and re-engineered to either remove public awareness indicators or to function when a user hasn't prompted it to do so. The smart glasses developer Vuzix is also creating a smart glasses device specifically to be used for the purpose of security <coughs> and law enforcement deploying facial recognition technology. And finally, data breaches could result in hackers gaining access to location information about multiple people at once. And so because of much of the concern about smart glasses capturing unwanted photographs or videos will occur in public where there is no current legal remedy, um, the best solution is a public awareness campaign requirement. In Ireland, regulators asked Facebook to prove that the indicators on its Ray-Ban smart glasses could properly put people on notice that a photograph or video was being taken and asked it to undergo a public awareness campaign to do so. Smart glasses should also be banned from historically private places where their use will likely result in legal action anyway. These are bathrooms, locker rooms, hotel rooms, and personal residences. Regulations um, should also require that smart glasses be designed with indicators that show a photograph, video, or recording is being taken so that uh, smart glasses that can completely conceal such a functionality are not put on the market. Um, users that re-engineer these public awareness indicators should be held accountable by facing fines or other penalties as well if they hack into these uh, smart glasses and change their functionalities. More importantly, should real-time facial recognition technology in smart glasses be adopted by law enforcement? It must still follow the reasonable suspicion of criminal conduct tests outlined in Terry versus Ohio which necessitates the use of specific and articulable facts that indicate such suspicion. This means that rather than law enforcement smart glasses being always on, they should be, have to be activated to scan for facial recognition matches upon police being alerted to possible criminal conduct, such as when a traffic stop is occurring. Um, the Georgetown Law Center on Privacy and Technology recommends real-time persistent scans of facial recognition databases only in life-threatening public emergencies in specific locations for a limited period of time and upon a showing that law enforcement has exhausted other means to investigate the crime. The Georgetown study goes on to say that more funding should be provided to the National Institute of Standards and Technology in order to expand facial recognition database accuracy tests and that databases should be limited to those who actually have committed crimes unless state legislatures vote to allow driver's license databases to be used. The final issue is data privacy concerns. Smart glasses can collect the same amount, if not more, data as smartphones and other wearable technology devices. Smart glasses are also easier to misplace or lose, making them vulnerable to hacking. Because of their convenience, smart glasses may actually capture even more of a person's daily life than we might expect. It might even capture information that a user does not intend to capture, such as by leaving on a video recording and accidentally logging into a financial account. Also, because many smart glasses will allow users to connect and share data with social media accounts that are vulnerable to hacking, the glasses are an easy target. Due to the limited storage capacity of smart glasses, a lot of data will likely have to be transferred to the cloud, which is a weak, po a weak point for hacking as well. So the current law for data privacy, the United States does not have a, com a comprehensive federal data privacy law. It has been and a frequent topic of this discussion and has resulted in the introduction of numerous bills aimed at addressing this issue. But uh, instead, the United States uh, takes a sectoral approach, implementing laws that protect certain data sets in certain scenarios, such as the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act and the Fair, Fair Credit Reporting Act. Um, Next, we have the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, which affords California residents the right to know whether their data is being collected, the right to request information on the categories of data being collected, the right to know what personal data is being collected, and the right to delete personal data, as well as to opt out of the sale of personal information. Most notably, however, is that the CCPA includes a limited private right of action in certain situations where data has been accessed by unauthorized parties. 
Colorado, Connecticut, Utah, and Virginia have also implemented their own comprehensive data privacy laws, though they are seen as less restrictive than California's. And all of these states allow consumers to access and delete personal data, as well as provide uh, the option to opt out of the sale of personal information. In Europe, there is the General Data Protection Regulation, where consumers have the right to know the purposes of a company's data processing, and such processing cannot be used for any purpose other than the ones described. Data must be accurate and can only be kept for as long as it is necessary for the company for the purpose intended. And consumers have the right to access the data and correct any inaccuracies. Companies must also delete any inaccurate data it becomes aware of on its own. And consumers can request that personal data be erased, which makes it the most uh, restrictive data privacy law in the world. So as previously mentioned, smart glasses are simply a weak point for data hacking, and they are likely to have sensitive information on them, especially if they are used in a work environment. Plus, connections to social media applications leave much to be desired. Facebook, for example, partnered with Ray-Ban and created a pair of smart glasses, and they advertise it in this way. Uh, by default, Ray-Ban stories smart glasses collect data that's needed to make your glasses work and function, like your battery status to alert you when your battery is low, your email address and password for your Facebook login to verify it's really you when you log into the Facebook View app, and your Wi-Fi connectivity. You can opt in to share additional data, which includes things like the number of images you captured or how long you spend taking videos with Facebook for product development, improvement, and personalization, and this setting can be changed at any time. So it sounds pretty good uh, to a consumer. It sounds like they're taking data privacy seriously, but to use Facebook smart glasses, you must have an account with Facebook and connect them to the Facebook View app which can collect data on health and fitness, purchases, finances, location, contacts, search history, sensitive data, and more. So it's my suggestion that we need a federal comprehensive data privacy law. It's good for, big, <laughs> for business because it will help to standardize processes across the nation and help companies catch up to the comp uh, compliance requirements in Europe. It will also help to eliminate vulnerabilities in data storage due to cost cutting because companies will be forced to comply. My suggestions uh, for a data privacy bill um, is that the default of collection being assumed, but with the option for consumers to opt out. We know that uh, data collection is a huge revenue source for a lot of social media companies and other tech giants. So having it be an opt-in approach where consumers likely will not choose to opt into data collection uh, will harm their revenue flows. And instead it should be an opt-out for a consumer that is genuinely wary of their data being collect collected, they can opt out of the collection of personal data uh, based on that company's terms of service. Um, additionally, I suggest that there should be a data privacy preamble, which sets out all of the data that is being collected by a company at the very beginning of the terms of service. Um, and additionally, uh, tells you the purpose for what it's being collected on. And this should also state the rights of the consumer to either um, collect it, uh, to opt out of its collection, to erase it, to delete it, um, or just to inspect it. And so that's my uh, presentation. That's um, the, the three main arguments of my journal comment, which were that regulators should anticipate the adoption of smart glasses at at least some capacity and respond with a light touch approach for public safety and surveillance concerns, but by adopting a comprehensive law for data privacy. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Professor Harmon. Thank you, Liam. Thank you very much. Uh, and I will turn things over now to Professor Fishman to conduct his response to Liam's presentation. Thank you, Professor Harmon. I, I, I've read and critiqued dozens and dozens of student papers in my more than 40 years as a law professor. This is one of the best. Uh, and the pre presentation was superb as well. So my compliments. Um, it's when you're, you know, when you're given the assignment of critiquing and evaluating and commenting on, the better the presentation, the harder it is to find something to talk about. <laughs> so I'm going to nibble at the edges rather than plunge right into the middle because I think you've, you've, you've laid out exactly what we should be concerned about. First, with regard to the health implications. When I was growing up, and some of you probably can, I don't think any of you can relate to this really, but it was standard to go to the dentist every six months or so. And every trip to the dentist, they took an x-ray of your teeth. Now think about that. It was a health measure. It was to help your teeth get healthier. 
But we know now that that was highly dangerous. Um, and we have no idea right now how dangerous it would be to be wearing smart glasses 16, 18, 20 hours a week, a day, depending upon how nocturnal or not nocturnal the wearer is. So I'm wondering if, if first of all, it might be somewhat useful to issue a warning similar somewhat to the attorney, the attorney general, the surgeon general's warning that the health implications of wearing these for a long period of times is not known yet. And so but what users should be exercise caution and how long, how, how long, how many hours each day they wear them, or maybe even require by law that a pair of uh, smart glasses cannot function as smart glasses uh, for more than, let's say, I'm picking a number in them six hours a day. Um, now, both of these can be accused of being, you know, nanny state sort of implications, but, but you know, I, I think there are significant potential health risks um, that laissez-faire uh, let's see what happens in 20 years, uh, might not be the best way to go. Thoughts about that, uh, Mr. Fine? Yeah, I, I, I think it's good suggestions. Um, I think that the FCC would be, you know, uh, a little bit wary of putting out, um, you know, a warning about the health impacts of this type of device, because they're already clearing them for use um, uh, based on the 1.6 watts per kilogram um, standard that they feel is appropriate for this type of device. And they you, have- You point out in your paper in greater detail though, that that standard is like two decades old and doesn't necessarily measure the kind of uh, radiation that, that might have the greatest negative impact on somebody's health, so. Right, yeah, and I completely agree. Um, I just wonder if the FCC would be willing to put out such a statement before conducting tests that are specific to smart glasses themselves, because they've done these tests for smartphones, they have um, mannequins that are, are meant to, you know, push EMF radiation into on a daily basis and see where the biggest impacts have been, but they're for smartphones and they're mostly for adults. So uh, I, I think it would be really important for the SEC to study whether it changes at all if people are wearing these for, like you said, six, eight, ten hours a day right near their eye where that EMF radiation can be caught between the glasses and into a vulnerable part of the body. Um, but uh, to your other point, I think it's really important that the glasses are designed with the um, intent to be turned off um, if they're not being used for the capability of connecting to Wi-Fi or Bluetooth within a certain amount of time, whether that's 20 minutes or 30 minutes. But, you know, I can imagine the scenario where someone turns it on to connect to the internet or something like that, and they forget to turn it off, and it's constantly emitting that EMF radiation. Um, so I think if it's not actively being used, it'd be important for the glasses to have the capability to turn off on their own. Um, thank you. Um, another uh, aspect of, of the, the, the two primary concerns that I have, of course, as I think most of us do, are, are the, um, the intrusion into individual privacy and the accumulation of data that now becomes accessible to, uh, to the companies that, are, that, are, that are collect them, to government agencies that might subpoena them, and to hackers that might uh, hack into a system and steal them. Um, and, and Really, in, in a sense, smart glasses don't do anything that isn't already available, but of course, they make it so much easier to do it, and potentially at least easier to do it surreptitiously. Uh, we all know that somebody can pick up a smartphone and start photocopying, uh, videoing and, and, and recording what's going on, but that at least requires a degree of visibility. Smart glasses, as you point out, might not. Uh, and so whether or not there's any way that that can be controlled electronically uh, in terms of software, whether or not that software can be hacked into, whether a, a buyer can simply turn off the privacy protection aspects of, of a particular brand of, of, uh, of, of smart glasses. We know that people will be trying minutes after they buy a copy of, of the glasses. And so uh, that's a, an issue which you address. I'm just wondering um, how, I, you know, you, part of the problem is that federal law in particular is woefully inadequate in protecting privacy. Um, you, you go into some detail, and I, I praise you for that, uh, about the federal approach to, to oral, uh, intercepting oral communications, it's simply a conversation that two people, people have within earshot of each other with no one using an electronic means to actually be able to hear it, that's an oral communication. It's protected only if it's done under expecta reasonable expectations of privacy. And the more ubiquitous this material, these equipment becomes, the less a, a realistic expectation of privacy is reasonable. 
So what we need, as you urge, is to Congress to create a national standard of what expectations of privacy are legally reasonable. That's the only way we can legally hope to control uh, the capabilities of device and how people use them. Uh, because I mean, I mean, I, I, if if I'm sitting in a restaurant and two people are having a conversation with an ear with with within naked ear hearing, I can record it, and that's not a violation of, of federal law, and in, in most jurisdictions, it's not a violation of state law either. For that matter, I can video it in a restaurant. It's a public place. Um, not to mention what a surreptitious use of, of these glasses might do to a, a one or two or three person private enterprise, whether it's physical or emotional or whatever, um, and so. Without that sort of comprehensive determination by Congress as to what expectation of privacy should be legally protected, regardless of the type of electronic equipment that's capable of, of recording it or not, you know, we're all basically throwing throwing seeds in the wind and hoping something will plant that will uh, make make sense. I'm sure Congress will get around to that as soon as they figure out how to fund the government. Um, <laughs> The the one uh, one other criticism I have, or or a disagreement at least, is that um, I think every capability of data collection should be opt in rather than opt out. Realistically, it's very easy for lawyers and technicians to draft opt out options to be virtually incomprehensible. Uh, and most people, when they buy a new product, they want to use it, uh, and they don't pay much attention to that. Um, and, and that's why I think mandating by federal law, if not federal law, by state law, uh, that certain functions of data collection must be opt in only, um, while somewhat cumbersome and, and certainly cutting into uh, Meta's uh, uh, revenue stream in Google's and Apple's. I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for those mega corporations' concerns over their uh, revenue streams. Clearly, we want them to be profitable, so they'll continue to innovate. Um, but I think the threat to personal privacy would mandate an opt-in rather than an opt-out uh, with, with, all, with all equipment capable of collecting data. Um, whether that's ever going to happen, given the lobbying capabilities of these corporations is, 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 is small. Uh, Europe managed to do it in, in many ways, and maybe some way we can too. Within those limitations, which are slightly beyond your capacity to control um, in, in this article, uh, I, I think you've done an excellent job of, of describing the, the technology, even to someone whose knowledge and understanding of technology is rooted somewhere in the 1980s, um, and, and, um, and laying out some of the parameters of the problems, health, privacy, and data, uh, that they enhance and exaggerate the, over what we even have to face today. So my compliments. Thank you. JG, back to you.